How's everyone doing this morning? I hope you're doing just fine. We are gathered together to study a portion of God's Word. We've certainly gone to God already in prayer. We have sung to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, praising God and encouraging each other. And it's a blessed privilege to be here this morning with each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. As we move into the Bible Authority series that we're, that we're looking at these past several weeks, and we'll have a couple of more that are coming for us. Today we're going to focus on instrumental music and the use of instrumental music during a worship service to God. So the, you know, the, the question, the big question for many, many, many years now is instrumental music, is it okay? Is it not okay? Uh, if not, why not? If it's not okay, why is it not okay? Where does it tell us that it's not okay to use instrumental music when we're praising God in song? You may remember that when I began this series, I started by mentioning uh, one of my relatives who's very young, just fresh out of college, that she had texted me and asked me, why don't we use uh, instrumental music in our worship? And then I just replied to her uh, a basic statement, we don't have the authority from God. And so she replied back and wanted to know more, and I realized that something was happening, and she said, well, I'm, I'm in a conversation, and my friend thinks that it's fine. And so then I tried to craft my words and the scriptures that I would use to help her where she was in a conversation with someone that she was trying to share what she claimed to believe. This is why it set in so strongly for me was that she needed someone's help to try to explain what she believed. And that's very worrisome to me. Uh, I am commanded in scripture not to worry. It's concerning. I'm concerned about those, especially our young people who know we don't use instrumental music and they're pretty sure we shouldn't, but they have no idea why. That's not good. That is not good. We talk about many times passing on the torch of faith to the next generation who's coming up to instill the fundamental truths that God set before us so that when it's their turn to hold that torch and to carry the light that God provides for the whole world, that they're ready to do that. That there's no dark spots or I don't know or just not sure about that left in their minds. They have us to ask us these questions and we should be ready and prepared to answer those questions effectively. My first approach as we look at it this morning will be a positive approach. I want to stick with what we've been talking about throughout this series, and that is the exaltation of God's authority increases our faith. As we exalt God and His authority, we do what He says, the way that He says to do it, that that is a step that we take that strengthens our faith. We are standing on the promises. I'm so thankful that that was the first song we sang together this morning. We are standing on the promises of God, fully and wholeheartedly resting on that which God has given us to do. And so if the Lord wills, next Sunday we'll look at the Old Testament approach because that's the other side of it. You've heard this with me. People will say to you, they, they used instruments in the Old Testament. God promoted and required instrumental music in the Old Testament. And so we need to answer that. Uh, we need to be settled in that. Well, what does that mean for me? Is it even true? So we'll, we'll look at that next Sunday if the Lord wills, but I'm going to stay positive today. I'll do my very best to stay positive because we are striving here to exalt God's authority. And brothers and sisters, you know this, we need His Word so that we can be pleasing to Him. He is our God. He has created all things. One thing I've thought about all through this week that I don't have here in my notes, but it just keeps coming up in my mind, is that when you watch Jesus on the earth, He will command the storm to be still. And what happens next? Instantly, it is perfectly still. Creation responds immediately to Jesus Christ and His Word, the way that it's been commanded to respond. Never is there a variation in that. He casts out demons, and when He says, come out, they have nothing else to do but come out. He controls the demonic world with His voice, with His words. He killed the peach tree, not the peach tree, the fig tree. He withered that fig tree because it wasn't producing fruit. And remember, the apostles marveled because it withered so quickly. They said, how can this be possible? Because he cursed that fig tree and it withered instantly. He will ride a donkey into Jerusalem that's never been ridden on before. You don't get on an animal's back that's never had a person on its back before. You can't do that. There's going to be a lot of fighting going on the first couple of rounds that you try to train a donkey or a horse or anything else you try to get on top of. It's, these animals wouldn't just accept that. But the picture God gives us when Jesus sits on a donkey 
that has never been ridden before, the picture God gives us is the most stubborn of all creatures, is in submission to its maker and its master. And he will ride into a city who will refuse his word. People don't want to hear what God has to say, even the most religious. They would not accept him as God's son, and yet the donkey did. There's pictures of this over and over and over again. And so his authority, what he says is very important. We have to know that as we speak to our little ones and as we think about our own faith in the confidence in the things that we do. I have Ephesians 5 for us. You can certainly be turning there with me. Ephesians 5. What I want to say, though, as we begin reading this passage is that this letter is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's addressed to the Christians initially, first and foremost, the Christians who are in Ephesus. The letter to the Ephesians, as, is it, as it is often called or referred to, is to all the saints who meet and worship God in Ephesus. Think about the letter when it first arrives to the church, however that it came to them, that they would open that or unroll that scroll and they would begin reading to the brethren that Paul had given instruction to, guided entirely by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul says so many brilliant things in Ephesians. He, he immediately in chapter 1, chapter 2, brings them up into the heavenly places. God has established you. You are a child of God. Your, your citizenship is in heaven. He lifts us up into the heavenly places. And in chapters 3, 4, and 5, he comes back down to earth to say, here's what you should be doing now because your citizenship is in heaven. Because of all of the, the beauty that God has granted to you in the spiritual realm, be this now. And there's so many fantastic things that he tells them. Look at verse 1, Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. He is simply saying to us the same thing that Jesus told us. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Paul tells us here, be imitators of God as His dear children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We are to walk in love just as Christ showed us. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. So you, you see that picture there. He's, he says, you, you are in Christ. You are children of God. You are, you are brought up into the heavenly places. Don't let these things be named among you. Uncleanness and covetousness. These things are wicked and awful and no Christian should be uh, found around or near these things. Verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I'm, I'm, I'm reading these verses because I want us to see that he's, he's speaking to the Ephesian church and to us. And he says, you are children of light. You are children of God. And so he's speaking to the church. That's how we know the instruction given is for the church, the body. When they read this, they will know. They will have more instruction on how they are to behave in the world and most certainly how they are to behave within the confines of the church and the worship services that would take place there. Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Take note of verse 17. Don't, don't be unwise. Walk circumspectly. Walk very carefully. Be careful how you live, how you act. Be careful in the things you say. Be careful in the things that you do because you have a God who loves you and He cares and He is intimately involved and ultimately sure of everything you have said and done. He knows everything. Imitate Him. Strive to be more and more like Him, not more and more like you, not more and more like me. More and more like Him. And in verse 17, He says, 
Do not be un unwise. And what's the opposite of that? But understand the will of God. So you want to be wise, then you need to know the will of God. Don't be unwise. You don't have to be. You don't have to remain there. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 19 is we're thinking about, is it okay to use instrumental music in songs of worship to God? We have the instruction again. I'm not going to try to jump into all the conversations that have taken place through the last several decades. What I want us to read is what's here. What did they know to do when they read this? Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. What's the answer to the question? Look at Colossians 3 with me for just a moment. We'll go back to the passage that John had for us. Colossians 3. We'll narrow down here to just verses 15 through 17. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 15. I want us to see the similarity of the instruction with the Ephesian brethren and now the Colossian brethren. Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body. Again, this is a body of saints. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. If we think about these two passages side by side, we can see very clearly that the service of singing to one another and praising God is called speaking. Paul says speak to one another. It's called teaching. When we sing, we teach one another what the Word of God teaches. These are spiritual songs. They are in line with and according to God's will. Many of you are familiar with the times that we've had to look at a particular song that ended up in a hymn book, and we realize this is not according to the Word of God. This does not fit what a spiritual song should be. We can't just make things up. It has to come from God's Word, and we try our very best to be sure that what we are teaching is the Word of God. It's put in the form of a song, of a psalm, still focused and centered on God, and yet there's the rhyming and the melody that's applied so that we can sing as we've been commanded to do. It is a good thing for us to teach one another and admonish. Admonition is for someone to say to me or to you, what you're doing isn't right. You need to get your heart right with God. Have you ever been admonished by a song, by a hymn? I mean, just think about through your life. Have you ever been admonished by a hymn? I know that I have. I read through as we're singing the hymn and I get to a point where it says, Lord, let us not ever do this. We just sang, yield not to temptation. That's an admonishment. Don't let that happen. And the, the implication is you are letting it happen. Don't yield yourself to temptation. It will tear you down and destroy your soul. What about before you were baptized? The conviction on your heart, maybe from a sermon, but also from the invitation song that we sing. Why do you wait, dear brother? Why do you wait, poor sinner? Oh, why not tonight? That is admonition, to do what is right. And we sing this to each other purposefully. This is not just a situation where we say, we don't use instrumental music, therefore everything else we do is right. No, no, no. We have a condition of the heart that we just read about that has to be in place. Are you just mumbling along the words that are in the hymn? Are you barely getting anything out as we've come together to sing, to teach, and to admonish one another? If you are just barely mumbling some words out and you don't know what verse we're on and you're not even sure what's being said, that is not good. Our heart is tied to this. We are to make melody in our heart first and foremost. We are to sing with the tongue, with our voice, and with our lips. It is called the sacrifice of praise and the fruit of our lips in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. We are also commanded in these verses to sing with thanksgiving. So again, if you're barely making it through, can, can you say to yourself, 
boy, there's a lot of thanksgiving pouring out of my heart as, as I give half of my heart to this song. There's a lot of things that can get in the way of our song service. The song leader, he's doing something we don't like. Uh, he's doing something we really like. Whatever it may be, that can deflect from what God has commanded us to do. I am to make melody in my heart. I am to sing with thanksgiving always. And that is a challenge. Sometimes something horrible is going on in my life. Sometimes something horrible is going on in your life. And we are to thank God. How? Why? We are to say to ourselves, I'm not sure what you're doing right now. I am not sure what you're doing, dear God. But I am sure about what you've done. And I thank you for eternal life. I thank you for the glory that you revealed. I need this pressure to be lifted, but until then, I will thank you with all of my being because of who you are. Can we do that? Thanksgiving always in all things. One of the biggest questions I've asked, two of them really, how do I surrender myself to Christ's authority? And number two, how do I discern his, his instruction? Think about instrumental music with me. Can we, as a church, be proclaiming Jesus Christ if we add instruments of music to what we've read in Ephesians and Colossians? We've been commanded to sing, to make melody in our hearts, to teach, to admonish, to encourage with thanksgiving in our hearts. Can I add something else to what God's given me to do in these passages and still say that I am proclaiming and honoring Jesus Christ, my Lord? What does He think? We need to know the answer to that. When the saints are gathered together for the purpose of worship, please understand, when we're gathered together for the very purpose of worshiping God, our singing here in this place is and should be the result of what the Holy Spirit has commanded us to do. What we do here is the exact result of what we've been commanded to do by the Holy Spirit. We are not to add to or to take away from. Which is why every Christian should be singing. It's an opportunity for us to join our hearts and our minds and our voices together in songs of praise. We are to have grace in our hearts. We are to make melody in our hearts. The instrument of the heart is employed by all believers as we sing praises to God and as we encourage each other. Such a beautiful picture. The heart, the thankful heart is joined together with all other thankful hearts and we employ our hearts to sing praises to God and to encourage and admonish one another. Your voice your voice. I want to make this very personal for you and for me. Your voice and the words that you use allow your thoughts to be expressed and shared. The voice that you've had. We've used it sometimes in some beautiful moments. I can think of quite a few actually that I thought, man, I'm glad I said that. I do. I do. That was a big one. Hearing her say, I do, was even bigger. You're just still not sure, are you, until she says it? And I've said some things that I wish I had never said. And I've used my voice in a way that was threatening or overbearing or hurtful on purpose because of my heart. But God gives us this freedom to use our voice, to share. It is the words that we use is the vehicle of thought that, that shares an idea with someone else. God knows that. And so He says, use your voice, the fruit of your lips, in sacrifices of praise to Me. That is what God has required. And each one of us has a unique voice. You know, think about the moments of your life. I, I, can, I can change and alter my voice to accomplish all kinds of things. If, if I know my wife, Karen, is not doing well, she's not feeling well, I'll change my tone and my voice. I, I, will, I will calm down. I will come close. I'll hold her hand. And I'll speak to her in a very soft and gentle tone in, because I'm trying to accomplish two things. One is reassuring her that I am with her. And the other is to comfort her. So, so, so there's reassurance and there's comfort. And I can accomplish that in my voice. 
when I correct my children when they were younger, they don't need correcting anymore. They're, they're perfect today. But, but back when we were working on them and correcting them, I would raise my voice and use a strong voice and come down hard and let them know that I'm serious about this. We're not going to talk about this again. But the same child and the same father whom I held in my arms before I laid them down in bed to sing a song to them or to put my hand on their chest all the way across the chest. My hand used to go all the way across their chest put my hand on their chest as they lay down for sleep and tell them, I love you more than anyone in the world. That my voice was uniquely designed in that moment to share my thought. I want them to believe me. I'm telling them the truth. I will give my life for you. As long as you're in this home, you're safe. I will go first. If there's ever any trouble in this home, I will go out first to take care of the trouble. So the voice that I have and I use, now God's asked me to come in and to bring it into worship services and to praise God. How do I do that? I change my voice. I alter my voice in a way that shows reverence, thanksgiving, love, respect, a willingness and a desire to teach the brethren whom I love. We should be singing all the time and never wanting to quit. There are so many good things that take place. And yet, because it's routine and mundane, we get to a place where we say, well, at least we're not using instruments. And we have failed when we get there. We are following the pattern that God has given to us. We are following the design that He has laid out. Look at John chapter 4. Jesus says something very interesting to the Samaritan woman at the well. John chapter 4 We'll just pick up what he says to her in verse 22. John 4 and verse 22. He says to her, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Remember the point I made that when the saints are gathered together for the purpose of worship, our singing is a result of what the Holy Spirit has commanded us to do. God is seeking such to worship Him in spirit and in truth. What truth? Whose truth? His truth stands alone. We can't add anything to it or it wouldn't be His truth. And so when we worship, we worship in spirit and we worship in truth. We praise Him in song as a church. We have His instruction on the right way to do that. And so that is what we do. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with me. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26. First Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has the interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Paul says this many times in chapter 14. All things must be done so that the church would be edified or it should be done for edification. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but God is the, God, is the author of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Should we be divided? in anything that we do in our practice of worship. Is it okay, because that's that's part of the other question, is it okay that we've just decided to stay very rigid and, and just stick with what God has given to us, refusing to add to what He's given? But if someone chose to do that, I'm not really in a place to say that's good or bad or that God would disapprove or approve. I, I reject that idea, but... This eliminates that because Paul says to the Corinthian church, is Christ divided? Can we not decide how to come together and worship? Congregations these days, even those that are wearing the name Church of Christ, are having two services on a Sunday so that they can use instrumental music for one worship and then have a second worship for those who would rather not and then let them come in and worship with no instrumental music. Can I ask you again, is Christ divided? Apparently, some people think that he is. Because I would never go to one service, and yet I really do want to go to the other. Whichever one I choose. Christ is divided. 
The church has agreed to split itself in half and separate its members so that we can accommodate the young or whoever it is that wants to hear instrumental music. Christ cannot be divided if we are going to glorify Him and do all things by His Word and by His authority. Look at verse 40 of 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. That's how the church should behave. Let everything be done decently and in order. Our faith, brothers and sisters, is centered on God's authority. Romans 10 and verse 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We believe all that He said. So, the exaltation of God's authority strengthens my faith. What faith? The faith that comes from hearing the Word of God. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. My faith is strengthened because I have heard the Word of God and because I abide in His Word. We believe all that He has said. We believe all that He has said. We believe here locally at this church that what He has said will suffice and we'll do it His way. We do our best not to add to the Word of God. Our allegiance is to Jesus Christ and Christ alone because He is the head of the church. Colossians 1 and verse 18 tells us He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. Colossians 1.18 tells us that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church, so that He may have all preeminence. And, and can I suggest to you that if we were to add something to what He's given the body to do, He is the head. If we add something to that, because we desire it, is He preeminent? Is He preeminent in our decision to do something He has not authorized? I think we all know the answer to who took the preeminence in that decision, no matter what it is. That if we leave His Word and His instruction on the way we behave in our worship services, that He is no longer the head. He is not preeminent. Either we believe that He needs some help or we have just taken it from Him. And that cannot happen in a body that is in service to the head. It cannot happen. We love our Savior and our Redeemer. Colossians chapter 3. I'd like to finish with this passage. We started here in our Scripture reading. Colossians 3. And again, just think about all that we've said and uh, studied this morning. Verse 16, let the Word of Christ, whose Word? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name. That is, by the authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we, as I, as I pointed out before, we are striving to do that here and we will continue to do so. One thing I could have done this morning is use Bible authority and spend this time in service uh, studying God's Word speaking to you about Easter. You may have noticed, we do have some visitors with us, and, and for those of you who are with us today, you, you may have noticed that we don't have anything posted in or on the building about Easter. Just, just a simple fact. There's no signs out front encouraging the world to attend an Easter service. We will exalt God's authority throughout our worship on this Sunday as we do each and every Sunday, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. We will, however, exalt God's authority and Christ's authority by partaking of the Lord's Supper this morning at the 11 o'clock service. Because He said, do this in remembrance of Me. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim His death until He comes. We're a body of Christ who loves and serves God through His Word. We anticipate His coming 
and we want to be sure that we are following all that He's given us to do. We've not added to or taken away anything that He has given to us. In Acts 20 and verse 7, it says, Now on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. They met on the first day of the week. They partook of the communion. And Paul preached to them on that day. There is an idea that what we've chosen to do, just here, I know there's other congregations who also do not use instrumental music, but there's going to be an idea that probably already is that, that we are a, an old-fashioned group. Um, we're kind of stuck in our ways. Uh, we're, we just don't use them. You can ask the preacher. He'll, he'll tell you why. We, we, just, we just don't do that. Um, we may find ourselves saying, I actually like the singing. I'm glad there's no instrumental music. But so what? It's not about what you like. It's not about what I like. It's about honoring the Word of God. And so as these conversations develop, we have to be sure about where we are and where we stand on these things and exactly why. And again, I, I, I know one lesson wasn't going to do it. Uh, I want to bring something else to you concerning the Old Testament. But we are standing on the promises of God. And that looks like something. I believe with all my heart that the more we stand on what God's given as we watch the world drift away from that, and go further and further off into perdition, that we will be a shining light just as we're supposed to be. We're not the same congregation as there are on this street, this very street. We are very, very different. And we're different for, for many reasons, but all of it can be found in the Word of God. And we must be sure of that. To worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is seeking such to worship Him. And we're doing our very best. There's anyone in our number this morning who needs to respond to the gospel? You know that invitation is always offered here. There may be a precious soul who is gathered here with us this morning who needs to make their life right with God, to, to repent of their sin, to turn away, to confess the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord, to put them on in baptism, to know that when you are baptized, you are washing away your sins and that you are to walk in newness of life as a new creature before God. If we can help you with that, we want you to come forward now. And I'll say to all of you who are here gathered ready to sing, to encourage one to come forward, sing. Be thankful for all that God has done for your precious soul. Let's sing together as we stand and encourage one another.